Okay. <laughs> I think we're live. It's always such a, um, like, I never know. Like, I don't trust it until I see it on Facebook. So. Exactly, yeah. Right? Like, should I, if I'm picking my nose, is it time yeah. to stop? Like, when should I stop? <laughs> I just want to make sure that I don't swear. And then when it says, is this Oh, right. Swearing. I know. Okay, where are we? I want to make sure that we are here. Let's see. That's crazy. Um, are you looking at your phone to see if we're on? Yes, we're on. Yeah. Modern world. Yeah, so we did it. I know. <laughs> I feel like the most tech savvy pe person ever this week. Like I figured You're out. Pretty, you are pretty dang tech savvy. Right now I am. Yeah. Thank I mean, God. let me just tell you where I live. Technologically speaking, it's about 2001. <laughs> I think that must be a relief. So wait, well, some, wait, I have to introduce you. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. This is Karen Carbo. She's my very good friend. And this uh, is Ann Garvin. She's my very good friend. She, yes. And uh, unfortunately, I am live streaming from Wisconsin and, and Karen is in Collier, France. So um, that's why she's got rosé and I've got coffee. Look, is this the perfect It's the perfect. I know, and I'm in my pajamas with my glasses on and my, look at my hair, you guys, look at right here. <laughs> and I have my bathing suit on under this little, you can oh, buy you these know? for $10 at the market. <laughs> They're made in Italy, and then you wear them over your swimsuit. Okay, so I have to tell you a little bit about Karen and I, and then we're going to chat. We already started, we launched into chatting before we were, um, <laughs> I know, that's so funny. So. Um, I met, well, Karen doesn't know it, but I met her ages ago when she was writing for Mademoiselle Magazine. Um, she had an advice column and I was following all of her advice. And then I read a book that she wrote called Motherhood Made a Man Out of Me. And she knows this story because I've told her this many times. And I had just become a mother and I felt like I just needed somebody to understand me. And Karen understood me in that book. And it was, it's a novel. It's not a, it's not a memoir. And um, I remember laughing and laughing and then crying when I was reading it. Not because it was sad, but because I was like, she gets it. <laughs> and um, so then, so I had such an unbelievable fangirl thing going on with Karen that it was almost unbearable. And then I created the Tall Poppies and I wrote her a message that said, you know, as restrained as I could possibly be, I love you. Please be my friend. And could you be a tall poppy? And she was like, so gracious. She was like, awesome. Yes. And then we've been friends ever since. That was pretty much it. That was, it was kind of like in fourth grade. Totally like that. Or maybe second grade when you say, well, you'll be my friend. And the other person says, okay. And then that, then that's it. And that's it. Yeah. And so I visit Karen and I have seen each other in Portland and then I visited her twice in France and I was planning on visiting her again this year but then of course the virus happened and it shut everything down but I've been to Collier and um, I had never heard of it before it's in the south of France and it's the most beautiful place so Karen you moved from Portland we did in May of 2019 yep. and you know it wasn't so much, I mean, you know, in fact, I'm writing an essay about that right now. You know, the people that would be like, I'm leaving if <laughs> fill in the blank, you know, I'm leaving, I'm getting out of here. And um, that really, you know, there are many, many reasons people do things. And, uh, you know, we had been coming to Collier, which Collier. Is impo Collier. it's impossible. We don't even pronounce it correctly. We've lived here for 15 months. <laughs> um, but, you know, we had been coming here on vacation for many years. And then we started, um, or I started this writing retreat for writers of all um, stripes, of all of people that wanted to begin writing or people wanted to, you know, work on their writing. Um, and we had been doing that for a couple of years. And then it so happened, I mean, every time we would leave, well, a funny thing would happen because when we first came here, you had no houses had internet. You had to go to like the kind of chintzy internet cafe. Yeah. Remember internet cafes? I do. Yes. But then every year we would come back and the technology would get kind of better and better and better until finally our house that we rented had internet. Yeah. And I would always write to people saying like, I'm in France. Like I would be working and no one cared where I was, it turned <laughs> out. 
So eventually we figured out that we could both work remotely. Um, nobody cared where we were. And our daughter got married. And the next day we started planning because we thought, she done, she married. And we also thought we need to slip out of town before she gets pregnant, which I think, I don't know, she probably would not like me, but I think they took us to the airport and then got busy because literally like two weeks later, we got a FaceTime saying, I'm gonna have a baby. So now I have a little teeny grand, a teeny granddaughter. You do, I know, it's, she's so beautiful. Well, thank you. I, th I wish people could see, like, I'm going to go through your Instagram and show some pictures so oh. that people will see it because it's so beautiful. But um, and you're busily um, making a house for yourself there. We are. We have never renovated. I mean, I think we've, I think we painted a bathroom when George Bush was president. That's maybe <laughs> the extent of our renovation and, and hung up a framed poster. So we bought this house that needed complete down to the studs renovation and that's what we're doing now. And um, yeah, here like I, I, said, I, I don't know why we thought this was going to be fun when we didn't even, oh yeah, that was the first, look, you can see there's our dog. Okay, this is crazy that you're I know, showing. I love that picture. <laughs> Such a good picture because look, your little dog is at the end of that hallway. Saying, what's going on? Trying to figure out what is going on. So cute, Desmond. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, we're doing that. Um, you know, it's very interesting actually being here and having friends and loved ones like you in the States. And um, well, you're writing from life, there. Yes, I'm you're writing from all there. your writing from there. It's and also doing Zoom classes and, and interviews and um, it's very strange that now that we're in this predicament that we're all interacting this way, because it really now makes no difference where I am, other than I am not drinking rosé for breakfast. I am drinking it. It is yeah, cocktail. Like, let's make it clear, right, everybody? Like, everybody's going to be like, I right. watched that Karen Carbo video, and she was drinking wine, and it's 9 a.m. <laughs> That's right. I know, in California, people are like, it's 7 a.m. They're like, what is she doing? So it's uh, almost like we should have a little France flag above your thing, so that people will, like call the call your a. Or a little clock down here, so you can see it's also Friday. Yeah, someone call yeah. her sponsor. She's falling <laughs> off the wagon. But I will tell you a little secret I've noticed because, you know, the French love to drink their rosé, but they drink it very slowly. Oh, not like we do in Wisconsin. Well, that's exactly it. So if you go for a little apero at a cafe and meet some people, they'll be nursing a little teeny thing of wine for an hour. And, that's you know, of course, it's, it, it hits in front of me and I'm like, so let's go swimming. And then I keep wondering why I've had three glasses and they're still on their first one. That's very American of you. I'm working on it. Yeah, I think it's hard to drink. The other secret, the other thing they do, which seems very, they, they, put, they put ice cubes in their rosé, so it dilutes it, so it, it lasts longer. Aww, I love that. Isn't that cute? And, oh, it's so good. Um, <laughs> so tell us, so Karen wrote, wrote this terrific book just recently, and, um, and we do, neither one of us has the copy to show you. But um, talk about- That's what good promoters we are. I'm so mad. It's, a good, it's so good you started the poppies because we clearly needed to have a, a gang of, of competent women to help us along. I'm going to find the cover on Instagram though. We can do it all like this. So <laughs> talk about it a little bit. Tell us a little bit about it. Um, I wrote a book that sort of tragically came out um, in late May of this year. Yeah. Tragically, because <laughs> the world fell apart. Nobody wants to hear about new books. Right. Um, called, well, and it's, well, it's called, Yeah, No, Not Happening. How yeah, I yeah. swore off, how I found happiness swearing off self-improvement. And you can too, as they said on the radio. They just took the sweary part out, which is oh. it's fine. Take That's the sweary fine. part out. Yeah. As so, you know, I have gotten feedback. People are saying like, it's really good, but why does it have to be so sweary? And you know, they're right. Why did it have to be so sorry? Other than, other than I gave up, I've given up, you know, oh. I've given it all up. I've but heard. really, um, 
you know, I wrote it last year when the world was a completely different place and it felt like women in particular, um, you know, everything that was kind of coming, coming to us online from influencers and, and, you know, uh, you know, obviously be more beautiful, be thinner, have better hair, look 25 forever, but also be more productive, be more creative. And it just felt like, you know, we were spending our whole lives trying to fix ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I felt like what that was doing, first of all, there was never a goal that you reached. There was always something more you could be doing. And also I felt like what it was doing was creating in ourselves a mindset that we were just never good enough. Mm -hmm. Because if you're always striving to be better at everything, what that's saying is who we are right now is not enough. Yeah, the subtext is a low self. The subtext subtext. is, right? And there was just never like, you know, I, I am a solid B when it comes to keeping my paperwork straight. And that is just going to have to be good enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is just it. You know, um, um, I just want to say a little bit about that subtext because I think it's super important. And, and one of the things that I know, so I was a scientist for years and years. And one of the and things still that are, madam. I am. I'm still a scientist. Yeah, you never get. To, you all once a PhD. And you're I'm, never I'm not a PhD. scientist. Yeah, you're never not a scientist. <laughs> I was just saying that because I was a nurse too, and you're never not a nurse. You're never not a nurse. Um, but um, but I was going to say about subtext. Like one of the things that we know, especially with the placebo effect, which is you know like a psychological effect of saying something works and then you feel like it does work. Um, one of the things that we know about the placebo effect is that if you come at people directly and say, this works, take it, the placebo effect is pretty strong. But if you don't say anything and you just either model it or you give someone sort of the side eye instead of coming at them, the effect of the placebo is like mm, so much stronger, like almost exponentially stronger. Wow. Yep. And so to me, what that says is we are super good at inhaling subtext and pulling it into ourselves in a way that, you know, our brain is saying, you know, like, I never want to go to a plastic surgeon and get a consultation because I don't want a plastic surgeon to come at me and go, "Hmm." you know, where I say, you know, I don't like this. And then he goes, yeah, that's not as bad as well i mean it's up to you but you know like, right because i don't want like i'd be like oh my god i'm a shit show like my face is and so i can't <laughs> right and i think that's what you're talking about this constant like self-improvement thing is like wow you could be better meaning you ain't there babe you aren't there <laughs> And, and, you know, and the other thing, too, is, and again, Anne, you know, this was written before the world changed forever. It's changed, Karen. It's not changed. Well, no, no, no. I think we're all talking of about other that, things. No, because no? there's all this stuff online saying how to be productive during the course. Well, that's true. How to, how to restart your yoga practice. Yeah, and how to make sourdough starter. That's, that's true. I don't think it's changed. I think it's just turned us all into people who live on the prairie. You know, I, we people who need self improvement and a haircut. Yeah, and people are saying like, I don't, I can't read. Well, okay, that's not a bad thing. Like, or I can't write. Well, you're a human being, and that's okay. Like, but there's always these. Well, maybe you should read in smaller doses. But also, you know what? It leads to so much self absorption uh-huh. and self consciousness because we're always measuring ourselves against yeah. everything and everyone in every circumstance. Yeah, like I can like. You know what it also it is to makes me think this is not going to be a very nice thing to say to men but you know how men the difference between women and men and their communication is women will be like they're all about the connection and they'll be like oh yeah mm-hmm. whereas men are all about the fix it no offense jared so like, <laughs> when i could see you over there so hi jared so like you know how they say that when you complain to a man they will try to fix it well i for, sort of feel like the same thing like if i say i can't read and then somebody offers up all this advice about reading you want to go i know what i can do i'm just complaining and uh i think it's the same the world is filled with a bunch of unhelpful men telling us to fix stuff when all we're doing is complaining a little 
And that's the other thing, and the other reason why I'm always getting Anne to try and move to France, I'm always trying to do it, is that the thing that's so interesting about the French is they have a culture of complaining. Like it's part of, that they can complain about things they love and still complain and everyone accepts that complaining is just, it's kind of entertainment. They think conversation is more interesting if you're complaining a little bit. Um, and they, they actually have different sort of, and I won't go into it because the nerd foo is so high, but there's different types of complaining. You know, wow. they, it's not just complaining, but it's, it's, this is one where I'm just sort of babbling. This is one where I'm going to do something. This is yeah. one where it's serious, you know. Yeah. Um, and I really feel like I found my home because I do love, a, I do love to complain and kvetch a little, even if I love the thing, even if I, you know. Well, you know, I feel the same way, obviously. I'm very much like to complain. Um, I wonder if our bloomies, if our bloomies are complainers. I don't know. They seem like such a jolly, optimistic Oh my lot. God, they're the most, they're, they're, our bloomies are, they do not seem to be complainers. Right? They seem right? super. Right? I feel in a way, because I, I just recently, I hosted maybe six, no, maybe it was two months ago. And I feel like the, they're holding up the whole world with their oh, optimism a I, little bit. They are the loveliest group of people. I feel like somehow the loveliest group of people all came together on our Facebook page here. Yeah. They are like the most, and even when other people win stuff, they're like, good for you. Like, they're so nice. I know, so nice. I know. So um, I hope, I, well, I think they will probably like me still if I admitted to being a complainer, but... <laughs> They're not, they don't strike me mostly as too, too many complainers. Anymore. They do not. They are just so pleasant. I know I love them. Um, one of the things too, I think that is, you know, if we can add a little feminist theory into this whole thing is that I think if you keep women trying to make themselves better, they don't run for president because they spend so much time working on their abs or trying to create a body that has perfect, looks great in the evening gown that you're never going to wear or a swimsuit that you rarely put on. And it's always, and, and it just, and the target also keeps moving. Like I heard a bunch of young women, um, a little younger than my daughter's 26, a little younger, and they were talking about their big butts. Like now having a big butt is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It Which wasn't a good thing when I was growing up. So just generation to generation, the impossible thing to have yeah. keeps switching. Yeah. So that I do think, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's some, some evil deep state that's masterminding all of it, but the result is the same, which yeah. is keep us focused on, uh, you know, our upper arm, you know, whether our upper arms are firm and yeah, we can't change the world. Yeah. We can't because we're so focused on our appearance. And again, I think that's a lot of, you know, major subtext that goes on. I, you're right. I don't think it's a big mastermind, but I think if we've decided that women are valued by the way that they look, whether they're firm or beautiful or young, then the women are constantly spending their time and energy and money. And honestly, you know, I put lotion on my face before we did this. I di obviously did not right. do anything about my exactly. hair. But, you know, exactly. Exactly. Like, I, you know, if there's not a sense that you can't, I mean, because you know, there are some things that we just love that are beautiful. Mm -hmm. There are some times we feel beautiful. And yes, but, but that's much different, I think, than the constant pressure yeah. to keep thinking no matter how pretty you are, you're not pretty enough because you're not whatever. Yeah. And I should say that's not to say that I don't understand makeup and plastic surgery and hair. I mean, I dye my hair. I you yeah. know, lipstick on, I, you know, I, it's not to say that I don't understand all of those things to fit into our cultural expectations. I do it. Um, I just don't always love it. it. And I get it. And I feel a little mad about it. But, um, you know, it is what it is, I guess, but I don't want to necessarily do all of the self-improvement all the time. Well, you know, not only that, but I think, I think it's interesting too that body, body dysmorphia is a relatively new yeah. um, um, syndrome. Well, that you know, I think body dysmorphia is super interesting because don't you think that you can look in the mirror and see yourself on one day and think, okay, I look okay. And then the next day you think, oh my God, what happened in that one day? <laughs> You know, why did I eat those can't? Why did I eat the, the those mint Milanos after dinner while I was watching 
Yeah. You know, so, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, that body dysmorphia is just that idea of seeing yourself differently in different circumstances like that. We can't really right. see each other. So right. that's fascinating, which I love that this is sort of moving right into your last book, the book before that. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. In Praise of Difficult Women is I think, um, I that too. you know, I think the thing was these women, I mean, they were always, um, I know thanks, Anne. It's hard to read. It's backwards. I In don't Praise of Difficult that. Women, Life Lessons from 29. Right. Um, there it is. There it is. Yeah. Um, but I think all of them were in, in one, one way or another sort of, sort of pushing back against what the expectations were for them in their time and place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, some, and something that, that in my, I did so much research for that book, but, you know, we are all the daughters of the time and place in which we were born and raised. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, women who were living in the early 20th century, they had a far more complicated and difficult road to hoe than we do. But like we said, that you know, the, the target keeps moving in terms of what we're supposed to be, um, you know, obtaining and what we're supposed to be reaching for. Mm -hmm. um, but I was really inspired by all of them. And I thought, you know what, it's time for me to make peace with what I know to be true about myself. And, you know, if, if I, if I uh, you know, have a C plus organizational skill, well, it's just gonna have to be it. I know. I, it's been. It's actually been kind of a relief to be able to say I'm not good at that. Right. And and be truthful about it. Like I'm good at certain things. Absolutely, I'm good at certain things. But then there's stuff that I'm really bad at, and I I just sort of embrace it and know not to take that on and and not feel terrible about it. Well, and I also think it's very interesting with the pandemic is this notion of productivity, because that was, that's also something else is you're supposed to be like, you know, a hot babe at all times and also like knocking it out of the park in terms of productivity. Yeah, um, right. It was really interesting as a sidebar. I read the audio book and when you hear it, sometimes I say productivity and sometimes I say productivity. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I never say forward. I always say forward wrong. Forward, forward. Forward. <laughs> forward. Do you say productivity or productivity? Productivity. Productivity. Yeah. I think productivity. I don't know what that is. Maybe it's just inaccurate. <laughs> but um, but now with, with the pandemic, yeah, you would think we would all have completely remodeled our homes and sewed throw pillows and our kids would be homeschool, they would be doing calculus and, but you know, that's not, as we know, that's not how life works. No, in fact, you know, we talk a lot about this foggy brain that everybody has. And, um, you know, I, especially in the beginning, I, I felt so foggy that I, I don't know what's happened. Like lately, I feel a little bit more energetic as evidenced by the fact that I just put this Zoom meeting into Facebook. But, um, you know, which is a huge, like, <laughs> I, it was a huge victory for me. I couldn't believe I figured it out. Um, so I, um, I know that that product, and I think, you know what I think is, I always think this too, that some people need to say yes more and some people need to say no more. Like, like the year of yes, Shonda Rhimes year of yes. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, I need a year of no. Um, because I do too much. Um, and so I think that that productivity thing can be a killer for some people, just a killer for us. Yeah. Because we feel bad about ourselves all the time. Yeah. And, you know, I do, like I said, the whole, the whole Im impulse for the book was just personally feeling like there was always this low grade sense of feeling bad. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. That whatever I was doing at that moment, I should have been doing something else. So what? Yes. Oh my. And that God. is, that's not a way to live because, no. you know, the, 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 the fact is, you know, we all have like tick tock. Mm -hmm. We all live every minute of our lives and that minute is not coming back and just spend mm -hmm. it thinking, you know, I'm working on my novel, but I should be really organizing the kitchen. I'm organizing the kitchen, but I really should be, you know, yeah. working out. Yeah. Doing another Pilates tape. Yeah, right. Yes, I, I think this whole thing is 
it's one of the conundrums of life, right? What What's good enough for the time that I'm alive? What's good enough right. for this moment? Right. Like, because uh, because we do have to make make a choice. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think that, and and often I have to say, like, so my daughter listens to a lot of TikToks, and um, and she and for a while I was like, oh my god, it's such a waste of time. How can you like it? I wanted to stop her because we spend so much time in quarantine together, right? But then I sat in the other room and I was listening to her watch t TikToks and she was giggling through the whole thing. Oh, like she was see? giggling, giggling. And I was like, well, how can that be bad? All those good chemistry giggling. Like she's laughing, laughing, laughing. She got, you know, the algorithm changes. And so like for, for a while, like whenever I watch it, all I ever get is dogs. But uh, because I look at a dog. That's good. Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah. So Megan is in this very funny she's got her algorithm working so it's all funny 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 and she just sits and giggles through it and so like yeah it's not good if she's watching it for eight hours but in the time that she's watching it if she's taking a break a giggling video is not a terrible thing you know so tell us some more about how is france with that like what's it like for french women well i mean you know it's interesting because because um french you know I think I think in general, and I've talked to French friends about this, and they didn't they didn't make a face when I said this, which means that they more or less don't do not disagree. <laughs> but you know, there is in French culture for women, there is the um, they do have to be thin. Thin well, is a big I, thing. I noticed that when I was there. However, as long as you're thin, it's pretty much then whatever you want um the freedom to sort of find your own style and be beautiful in your own way is is a lot broader than in the united states yeah they also um you don't compromise your femininity by being outspoken oh interesting right um they're very much sort of you know um the difference b between the sexes um, you know, they're, they're very much like men are men and women are women, but women can give as good as they get. You know, they, um, like I said, they, they can be considered very opinionated and very sexy. Mm. So, so it's just, but, you know, um, thinness is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, young French women worry about being thin. Mm -hmm. um, down here in the South, it, it's, you know, it's a little bit more casual, just the same thing. I think and always when you're in the south of a country, although actually the south of the United States has a, has a formality that I think, you know, that it, is not necessarily true, but, but, um, but in the south, there are a lot more, like I said, it's kind of a be more of a beach culture. Mm -hmm. um, but so, you know, and they, um, you know, they want to be, they worry about their kids and, and all, all, the, all the things, but they also don't do much for their kids. <laughs> you know, their kids like have to like figure it out. In fact, I have a friend who has, um, who had a, a, I guess it's maybe at four years old, five, four or five years old, they're sent away to sleep away camp for a week. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And all the French moms are like, you know, au revoir, à tout à <laughs> and the, the expat moms are like, oh my God, you know, my kid, I'm like, where, what if I never see him again? Um, so, and then the French women make fun of them because it's just a rite of passage that their kindergartner is going to go away for a week at a sleepaway camp. So <laughs> That's in that regard, so funny. yeah. So, I mean, they have pressures on them, but it feels like, you know, their kids do their own homework, their kids you know, they don't hover quite as much. Um, it's, there's a, there's, it feels like there's just a teeny bit more freedom in that regard. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, I'm reading right here that um, Marcy Kohler said, I really enjoyed. Yeah, no, I wish my younger self could have read it. And um, oh, isn't that right? true? Though? I know. Um, and you know, in fact, that's my, you know, if... 
because because an interesting thing about writers that maybe Bloom's already know this because they've been they've been around us a while, but they have. I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, we always think, oh, if I could, you know, have the number one bestseller and be on whatever the now the equivalent of Oprah is, I mean, is there an equivalent? But, but really, I mean, there's of course always these pie in the sky things that writers hope for, but there's also very specific goals, I think, mm -hmm. for each book. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, the idea that that my daughter or Anne, your daughters, or or you know, any women under 30 would read this book and go, oh, and just get a little, just an inch of, I'm not going to put up with all of this. I'm not going to feel the pressure, just right. a little, because, I mean, you know, to be quite honest, when you're older, of course, you do stop caring so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just one of the, one of the good things about being older, but I just wish younger women didn't feel so beleaguered you know, about trying to be all things to all people and, and, oh, I'm never hot enough. I'm never cute enough. My butt's never big enough. My waist is never small enough. Oh my God. Whoa. It's so true. And it's such a, such a difficult thing to stop thinking about. I think, you know, mm -hmm. you have to almost do thought stopping, you know, have you noticed there's a lot of talk about recently, maybe a, not a lot is maybe overstating it, but I've seen toxic positivity in a couple Ugh. of places and i hadn't thought about that but i thought my god toxic positivity is a drag and this I is from that. somebody who is inherently <laughs> the most cheerful person like i'm just sort of ridiculously cheerful but um but i think appropriately so like i if i'm angry you've seen me when i'm mad i mean i i stick i can be mad but, um, and I'm also an optimistic person, but that toxic positivity, which is, what is that? What, what would you say that is toxic positivity? Well, you know, I mean, I love, I think, I mean, I must've heard of that term, but I think it's that way that you're not real, that you're responding to a person or a situation without really hearing them or thinking about that and just saying like, it'll be okay. Oh, it'll, it, you know what, everything happens for a reason, blah, 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 blah. So what you're doing is basically dismissing reality or that person's experience, mm -hmm. which is not to say that you don't think, you know, it will go to bed. It'll, I mean, it will be what it will be. It probably won't be as bad as you think, you know, like it isn't to say that you're not, as you said, optimistic, Yeah. but it's sort of that you press the button and all of that blah, blah comes out. Yeah. I, you know, everything happens for a reason. Okay, first of all, if, if you're suffering something horrific, that is, that is like the worst thing to hear. Yes. Oh my yeah. gosh, all of those things are pretty awful to hear. Or the, you know- It'll you, make you stronger. Oh yeah. I can tell you right now, my father was, um, took care of my mother for 20 years with Alzheimer's. And he said, I want you to know that what doesn't kill you does not necessarily make you stronger. No. No, it could make um, you weaker. <laughs> it really wear you down. I also think there's that, this idea of living your best life all the time and all this, yeah, which is, you know, obviously we have an, a, a problem with um, uh, in Instagram life, you know, where everybody is making everything look their best, which is why I often try to take pictures of things like my messy desk and my which, you know, which is funny because I, I had a, a, a person take a look at my Instagram recently and she said, you, it's a mess. Like you don't have any sort of goal. And I was like, well, my goal is to show people what my real life is like. Right. So like, I, I, I think if you're going to get to know me, then to put a polished version of me online, it's just kind of dumb. Um, you know, and plus I also am interested, like, like, what is our best life? Like if you were really to sit and think about what that was, yeah. what, what would that look like? I mean, is it just base? I mean, do we all think basically it's a conflict free life yeah. because no life is ever like that. So I don't even know. I mean, I, I did, when I was writing this book, I, I sat down, I thought, okay, Karen, you get your best life. What is it? And basically it was pretty, um, it wasn't very creative. It was basically all the stuff that was bugging me right now. I didn't want to deal with it. The end. Yeah. And you yeah. know, and I mean, yeah. and then of course you think it's like a James Bond, like, like I want a villa. <laughs> I want to, you know, and it's like, but that, you know, that's not your best life. No. So right. I feel like it's, it's a phrase we say without really even giving it 
any serious thought about what that means. Well, and you I know, I wish I could teleport you here right now. That would be a good life. That would be my best life today. That would be my best and life tomorrow. as well, especially, except I might get a little car sick in the teleporting, but I think I'd get over it once I got to France. I think so too. Take a little boning before you hop in then to I the teleporter. Fine. Yeah. Um, I, uh, you know, the, I think what's always really interesting is when they say um, that uh, people that win the lottery, they spend all their money and they're miserable, but also they're not all that much happy. And the, a part of right. that is, you know, the family members and the friends are always like, give me some of your money because you have so much. Like, I think it makes people miserable money does if you end up having. You and know, then they always buy ridiculous things. Yeah. Like, that require they think care and maintenance. Yeah. So I, you know, I think that piece of understanding what your best life is, is, is pretty interesting. And, and recently I've come to believe that if at any moment I stop and go, is this pretty good? Like, are you fine with this moment? And I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have to rake these leaves and I'm not miserable. So that's an okay way to live your life. And we're like, you know, if you end up, if you actually are in moments where you spend a lot of time going, I hate this, why am I doing this? And I think, you know, within reason, we should think about maybe changing it. But I also think this is a very privileged stance, right? Exactly. You know, there was a there was a book that I mentioned in Yeah No Not Happening called Improv Wisdom. Oh, Do you know this that? book, Improv Wisdom? Oh. Well, it was it was written by a woman who teaches drama. It's or I think she's retired now, but she taught drama at Stanford. But it 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 takes sort of the premise of improv, where you basically get up in the morning and you make your bed and then you just wait and see what the day brings. Yeah. And she, I mean, she has, there's, there's, there's ways that you approach it. And of course, you know, one of the tenets of improv is that you say, yes, and. Oh, right. You know, so, and it's not like you're necessarily literally saying yes, and to everybody you run into, but whatever kind of presents itself in the, during the day, you're ready for, and you sort of add on to it. Right. And, and she wrote the book because I guess, she, you know, she, she tells a tale at the very beginning about being an academic that did absolutely everything correctly. And oh, by the way, it's such also a story of being a woman, a female academic, mm -hmm. because she was in some drama department and she served on every committee. And every time some, somebody had to take a leave, she would take their classes. And, and, you know, she even won some, you know, the, the, the red pepper award for being the most, the most, you know, energetic faculty member or something and all of this right. stuff. And she will, in the end, she was denied tenure because they felt that she hadn't published with enough rigor and she stopped and looked. And of course, you know, her, her colleagues in her department, like the men would come in twice a week for their classes but otherwise they were busy doing their research and doing their, and you know, there she was putting out the cupcakes for every birthday party and it got her nothing. In fact, oh. it got her disrespected. Right. So that's when she realized that, you know, she had spent all this time playing by the rules or what she thought were the rules. And it didn't, it didn't, achieve, she didn't achieve what she had wanted to achieve. So she had this great life change and she just started essentially doing what she wanted to do. Um, That's but it's a wonderful book. It's very short called Improv Wisdom. Yeah, I'll take a um, look at that. You know, one of the things right that... Here. I think I have it right here. Look, I'm going to roll away in this. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm rolling back. Improv Wisdom. Yeah. Oh, look at it. It's backwards. But you know, you guys can read backwards. Yeah. Don't look at that. Is it a fish? Look at the fish. Don't, don't prepare, just show up. Patricia Ryan Madsen. Bloomies, look, Improv Wisdom. Yeah, that looks really Improv good. Wisdom. There, no. no. I don't think that no. does. It just never works, okay. No, it never works. So, um, I think, you know, the interesting thing about that too is how little um, what women do just naturally is not valued. Exactly. You know, like it's, a va it's all that team building, all that cohesiveness, that's all very important. But it's not well, and you now, it on your, your, you know, resume. And now what women are doing in quarantine, you know, not only are they, are they working their jobs remotely, but, you know, you know, now they're overseeing all the homeschooling or all of the online schooling and the yep. meals and so much laundry. 
so much, so much food to make. So much food to make. Oh, I like, that's what I said. I feel like we're all on the Oregon trail right now. Like I felt I like, mean, and it's funny because I noticed, cause when Megan was moved in with me, my 20, 20 year old, she's 21 now. Um, in the beginning of COVID, I was burning myself like every three minutes because I hadn't cooked like that. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, you can't touch the pan. Oh, that's right. right. Like, so all of a sudden I noticed so much of that going right. on. And it's also, you know, instead of making lunches at the beginning of the day and packing them for people or, you know, your, your partner, if you're lucky enough to have a, you know, a good partner goes out for lunch. Yeah. Grabs a sandwich at the, at the food cart. But yeah, it's like you clean up the breakfast dishes and it's like, what's for lunch? And then, <laughs> what's for dinner? It's like, oh my God. I feel like that with my dog. And some people have three or four kids at home. Right. You know, um, it, I just have to say something to the Bloom group right now is that you are listening into a conversation that Karen and I would have if we were not live and we were just hanging around. Like this is, this is like not an interview. This is Karen it's and so Anne. Yeah, like nothing has changed. This is exactly <laughs> the kind of conversation. Maybe we're not as sweary as we Yeah, might a little bit less sweary, a little less angry maybe. Um, and uh but it's so funny because that's the, these conversations that i've been having with the different poppies they're not interviews they're absolutely not they're just like fly on the wall conversations that um that are like really a look into my friendships <laughs> <laughs> which i hope is interesting i like i hope people like it this you way. know they can just go somewhere they can go to TikTok if we're not interesting we'll never know that's the great thing no, it is. It is good. Well, we know. Like, we don't see, like, look, there's five people. Oh, there's four people watching now. Oh. No, you can see that. In fact, we do have five people. Oh, I can't. I'm glad I can't. I can't see it. <laughs> well, this is, a, I mean, normally we have these talks at six o'clock, but that was like 1 a.m. for you. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, um, so we I had did a book, up. I did a book thing that was at 11 o'clock p.m. It yeah. was, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, and it was a little and I mean I'm kind of a night owl but I couldn't like bring the bring, bring the, the party thunder. at 11 p.m. yeah bring the thunder Karen I couldn't have done that 11 30 at night I would have been sleeping for two hours and then woken up <laughs> that's what actually I was supposed to do something at some bookstore and it would have meant getting up at 2 30 in the morning and I just said you know <laughs> Oh my goodness, no. I can't. You know, if I had to I, get up at two three to drive you to the airport, I could do that, but I can't like we call it, I can't put on the party suit. <laughs> when I came to visit you, remember the first time I came to visit you? It was right after both my No, it was just after my dad died, because my mom was still living right. then. And I had already had my tickets and my mom was in hospice and, and I already had a plan to come see you. So it was after my dad died and I came and I had been so stressed through that time that I came and slept like hours at your place. Like I, I would get up to eat and then go lay down in the sun and sleep for more hours. Yeah. And that was the nicest thing because it's the most beautiful place to sleep. I have to show people a few more pictures of from your Instagram because like it's, Collier is the most gorgeous place. And if you're a writer, you can visit there because she does writing things. Um, and I am sometimes there teaching. With That's right. Her. Anne, Anne, has, Anne has been the um, guest author. I have guest authors and will be again. Oh, yeah, look, we have a little carousel. No, it's um, so God dang beautiful there. If I have, if some of you are art people, um, you know, the, the, this village, there's 3,000 people who live here. But what it's known for is um, in 1905, um, Henri Matisse came down here and, and started painting in a way that it sort of exploded his palette. And you can see the colors here are, are absolutely phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we that's, um, that's on a stormy. We do get weather. We do get a bit of weather through here. Mm -hmm. um, Collier is, we're actually 15 miles north of Spain. So mm -hmm. if you can imagine, it's where the Pyrenees Mountains meet the Mediterranean. So if you can imagine, I call it the thick neck of France, that France has, has this kind of neck that goes into the, the yeah. Spanish. 
to us. There are and that's so, where it is, right? This on the, is what you see the whole time you're there. It's not these choice views. Like it's this, it's this <laughs> all day, every day when you're there. It's most, it's tropical and um, and you have to fly, like I flew into Spain and then came down. Right. You can also fly into, well, you can fly into anywhere, but. Right. I mean, people fly into, into Paris and then take the train down through the center of France. And that's, it's a lovely trip. Not so much anymore because masks are obligatoire on public transportation. So you'd be there with your mask on for five hours. But. Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean. It'd be worth it if you get to come down to that space there. Do you, are you working on something else? Can we talk about that or do you not talk about it? Um, I'm working on a novel. Oh yeah. I am working on a novel. And um, Are you allowed it, to talk about it or no? Well, what I can tell you is that it, it, it's actually, you know, a trope that I've loved my whole writing life and I've never, I've never written about it, which is that, there's a precious manuscript that is unearthed. Um, there are these two women who have purchased a house in Collier and they find a manuscript, a valuable manuscript. And it happens to be, um, I don't know if those of you who are fans of Gertrude Stein or know the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, mm -hmm. which Gertrude Stein wrote pretending to be Alice, but it was Gertrude. And so this manuscript they find is Alice's true autobiography in which he dishes on Gertrude and everybody who sort of was here in the twenties and so on. So anyway, it's, um, it's a, it's a found manuscript and of course intrigue ensues. Oh my gosh. It sounds so good. Yeah, I really love good. that idea of a found ma manuscript. Don't you? That one that, that people didn't know existed. And then it, the other thing about it too, that is, is, you know, when these things happen is that people who have built a career and scholarship and auction houses and so on around a certain preconception, then everything yeah. is turned on its ear when this new information um, yeah. comes. So you write both nonfiction and fiction. Do you have a, I mean, I hate to ask if you have a favorite, but do you like one over the other? No, I find that I, I write nonfiction until I get, I feel, start feeling a little, that, 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 that having to hew to facts feels punitive. Mm -hmm. And then I write fiction for a while. And then when it feels like, God, I would love something to anchor me to planet earth other than my imagination, um, then I like, so I kind of go back and forth. It's such a, like, I, I used to write science and I write essays, but I don't write, you know, nonfiction. And I, I you know, I have to say it was, it was very interesting writing. Yeah, no, not happening because even though it sounds from the title, like it's just this kind of manifesto rant, <laughs> my editor was very um, rigorous about making sure that a lot of these ideas that I came up with were sourced and that I had read the thinkers who thought about these things and that I was able to support my rant. Wow. Um, so it wasn't like blathering and making jokes and, right. um, and so that, you know, th it, that was an, a wonderful exercise. It was hard. Oh, it would be hard. It was hard because yeah. I mean, obviously we need to source what we say and obviously we need to, you know, if something is not a new idea, you need yeah. to say, thought of it before. but yeah but it does require quite a lot of discipline and the other thing that was so funny and you know this Anne is that when I wrote it last summer we were in the middle of a incredibly brutal heat wave mm -hmm. <laughs> called canicule in French and the French I think now they've changed their minds but generally speaking they don't believe in air conditioning <laughs> so if I could believe like they don't they just they think it's well they think it's a waste of money. They think summer is the time for you to sweat and swim and drink rosé and sit outside. And now they also think it's not great for the planet. So, and they're not wrong, I think, about most of those things. However, if you're trying to finish a book, <laughs> I had days, we have this like cheesy, cheesy fan and I would get up and I would have had a t-shirt, a wet t-shirt I put in the freezer. Oh. And then wrap it around my head like a turban. And then I put ice cubes in my armpits. And, you know. I, oh, my I, God. I, until, because it was so hot. Oh God, it was so hot. That's crazy. Yeah. 
And there wasn't like, I mean, you could go to a little cafe that had like a ceiling fan, but there was no like, oh, you can go into Chipotle or Starbucks where the air conditioning was like, a, you know, a freezer. Yeah. Like, there was nothing like that. Oh my God, that's fascinating. I don't think I knew that. I think yeah. I knew it was hot, but I don't think I knew it was like that. So that's fancy. It was about 10 days. And, you know, we, um, I mean, we've had an amazingly beautiful summer, but la yeah, it was in June. Wow. And it was a hundred degrees a couple times, a couple days. And oh my gosh. yeah. Does, um, we should just ask, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Um, because we're coming We down. could sit here all day. I know we could sit here all day. We're already at 53 minutes, if you can imagine. Oh, I know it. I know, but look how good you are. Yeah, they could just like go about their business and come back in a couple hours and we'll still be here. We'll still be here chatting forever. <laughs> Because Facebook will support us until the end of days. You remember those marathon dances that people had in like the 50s? It could be like- They shoot horses, don't they? Yeah. They shoot poppies, don't they? Oh, that's kind of a bad thing. That's not you know, good, yeah. No, that's not good. I, I didn't say that. Ah, take ah. that out. Take that out, Ed. But um, yeah, we, could just, we could be here until tomorrow. Yeah, just, we could easily be here until tomorrow. Let's see. Somebody wrote- Let's see, I really enjoy, let's see, watch, watch, ice cubes in your armpits. Yeah, no, that's not happening, she says. Oh. <laughs> that does sound... So let me tell you a little real. secret. Well, I guess it's not a secret, because in the, in the remodel of this house, we're getting air conditioning. Oh, good. That's I mean, we, well, for one thing, part, and part of the reason is we're going, you, Anne, are going to come and visit, well, you know, know, and friends, and we're also going to hold our retreats here on the bottom floor, and I want... If, I mean, if it's just sort of an 85 degree day, that's nothing. But if we have a can of cool, which we will, you know, um, mm -hmm. again, we want to not, you know, perish because it's, it's really warm. Right. Yeah, right. Well, I think we're just going to say goodbye now because we can't, I mean, I don't know if we can stay all day, but, um, but uh, Really take a look at Karen's books because they're so filled with humor and wisdom. And I've been following her human, humor and wisdom for years and years. And, you know, I've got a perfect life. So oh, you're living your best life, Anne. No, I kind of am. Yeah. Except for that my daughter is going right now. I have nothing to complain about, really. No, I've got nothing to complain about either. Um, okay, so you guys, thank you so much for showing up. I thank you, Bloomies, everybody who hung in with us. I don't know how interesting it was, but we thought it was. We thought it was very interesting. I hope other people do too. So I um, will see you again. I'll see you soon, Karen. I'll be in France as soon as I can. All right, doll. Get here as soon as you can. All right, I will. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. All right. Bye.